and our first uh, uh, presentation or discussion item is a presentation uh, from the Street Activity Permit Office uh, on updates to the permitting process and new functionality on their new database. So I'll just turn it over to you guys. Come in, just please put your name into the record and it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm Don Tolson. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I'm the director of the Street Activity Permit Office and I have here with me um, two, three of my colleagues who will be introducing themselves shortly. Um, but I'm here today to present uh, the Street Activity Permit Office to you again. There have been some rule changes since I was here last, and I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with regard to our updated rules and regulations. I want to give you a recap of um, Manhattan as a whole and our permitting last year, and also then I'll turn it over to my colleague Paresh Patel, who will go into a little bit more detail about uh, the new database system that we're going to be launching, or might have already launched, <laughs> for the community boards. So when you log in now, you're probably, you're going to be seeing something different, and we just want to go over that so that you guys are fully aware of the true functionality of the new system. As you guys know, the Street Activity Permit Office falls under citywide event coordination and management. Citywide event coordination and management oversees uh, basically a lot of all special events citywide but the Office of Permitting, Street Activity Permit Office, that permits sidewalks, streets, curb lanes, plazas, that is the Street Activity Permit Office and we fall under citywide events. So this is just a quick agenda of what we're gonna be going over today, just some accomplishments since we last saw each other. Uh, event permitting, which is some of the new categories that we came up with after our last rule change. Uh, permit deadlines, because they did change when we changed our rules. Uh, the permit process, just a quick overview of the flow of permitting. Uh, Manhattan, which is uh, how permitting was last year, the majority of the permits that occurred in your area, things like that. And then permitting across agencies just as a whole are permitting. Looking forward, some of the things that we are planning on doing to further improve ourselves and our relationship with the community boards, as well as then the d uh, database system, which Paresh will be going over. So some accomplishments. Increased community engagement. We worked really hard uh, since we saw you last <laughs> to improve community engagements. <laughs> Some of you guys have very, very one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships with me as I worked with you to better this situation. We did update our website and we did add dedicated uh, pages for event types to help the folks that are trying to apply for our permits to better understand what those permits are. Um, if you have seen our new website, it is pretty detailed. It's got a lot of graphics and images. It's actually in the 21st century now. And um, it's a little bit easier to navigate so people can better understand what events it is that we permit and the type of events and the requirements for them. We tried to create greater clarity um, for applicants and more transparency, transparency sorry, for our community boards. And in doing that, we did try to have uh, one-on-ones. I know I've come to some of your community boards. I'm willing to come to all of your community boards and speak to um, the individuals uh, that are on your board, but also the individuals in the community. So block associations, anyone that permits, any just regular associations in your area, I'm happy to have that conversation with them to educate them more about our rules and our regulations. And then we tried to redistribute events across boroughs based on the event size and relevancy. Um, this was key for us because obviously the majority of our permits were in Manhattan, but we tried to kind of fan them out and kind of push them into other areas where they work a little bit better and match the community more. I know we got Nike to finally leave Manhattan and go to the Bronx and come to Brooklyn. So we worked really hard with these producers to remind them that there is not just Manhattan and there is not just Times Square. And we feel like we're doing that. I mean, it's a conversation in progress, but we're still working on that. Improved event management. We worked hard to decrease the number of events that were causing disruption in your area. Uh, last time, I met with a couple of you. Uh, there was a lot of situations where some health bans and other things like that were just setting up in your areas. There were a lot of illegal vending, things like that. We did let you guys know that if that happens, please contact us. Some of you did. We did reach across the aisle to these types of vendors and are working on a situation to get them co properly permitted. So these are things that we are working on. Um, uh, we did start working on. Increased bid uh, and CB notifications regarding our events in your community. That's your daily notifications. We worked on it. You should even be getting more stuff now because from our last meeting, we found out you guys were still missing a couple of things. So in your notifications, you're definitely gonna get more information and Paresh will go over that later. Uh, we created the violation section. 
in the database system to help track violation across events. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but now you'll be able to see those um, applicants that have had violations within the community. And the violations don't just come from our office. If they have violated health code regulations, if they violated NYPD regulations with regard to sound and other things, we put that in the system so that you guys have a little bit more information when you're making your determinations. You have that record from the other agencies of how these individuals have violated in the past. And it helps our organization because if they continue to violate, then we won't issue them a permit. When they apply, they will be denied because they are not being a good partner to the city. Event permitting. So uh, I'm sure you guys are aware, but we also permit specific programs uh, with specific agencies like the weekend walks. Fun times, the weekend walks. <laughs> so I do want you guys to comment on these other agency permits. In the past, some of you guys have just kind of said, well, it's DOT. I'm not going to permit out, comment on it. It's going to happen anyway. That's not the case. I want you to understand that your comments do matter. And if these things are impacting you in a negative way, if they're impacting the community in a negative way, please comment so we're aware of that. Um, this year, we changed it a little bit. So the applicant is the, um, the actual producer of the event is the applicant, as opposed to just DOT. So they'll be coming in a little bit different. They will still be categorized as weekend walks, but you'll actually have the contact information in the system of the producer of the event, not just DOT. So that'll help you guys more identify them, get them to come into your community board meetings and come before you and address the concerns that you have. And I've been very clear with them that they need to do that. Uh, play streets are play streets. That's going to start opening up this month. You're going to get an email from me probably this week about play street applications. So please send that out to anyone in your um, community that wants or is interested in hosting a play street. Uh, summer streets. That's mostly in Manhattan, and then Water on the Go, and they've just started their application process for this year, so if there are communities, uh, NYCHA holdings or anything like that that are interested in Water on the Go, please reach out to DEP and let them know because they are very interested in expanding the program into boroughs other than Manhattan, once again. Okay, so this is just a quick overview of SAPO in general and our permitting. So we did have some different types of permitting. We've always had cleanups, farmers markets, and health fairs. Religious events, we've changed that around a little bit. Rallies and demonstrations, we've restricted a little bit of that. Mobile units, block parties, plaza events are new, press conferences and production events are new. Single block festivals are the same, street festivals are the same, but street events are a little bit different. So I'm gonna go over those. Um, block parties, the deadline has changed. This is probably, this is the largest <laughs> event category that occurs in Brooklyn. So block parties are the same. Still no alcohol, still requires a 15-foot emergency lane, all those key things that people forget to do. Um, but that's still the same. The only thing that's changed there is the deadline. Cleanups still exist, and it's still 60 days. Farmer's market, 60 days. Health fairs is a new category that we came up with. This is for all those individuals that were trying to have all that health stuff and all that extra things at a block party that doesn't really belong at a block party. This is a new category. It does require a little bit more documentation, but it does allow these individuals to have a safe health event that is free not only to themselves but to the community. Um, religious events, we kind of did a subunit of that. It's called religious events. It includes mobile units, it includes sukkahs, and it also includes um, just uh, regular religious ceremonies that occur. Um, across the borough. And you guys do have a lot of mobile units, sukkahs, and religious ceremonies in Brooklyn. Sorry, going the wrong way there. Um, press conference rallies and demonstrations. We uh, focused this specifically on pedestrian plazas when we came up with our plaza rules. Um, I do want to be clear that if someone comes to you and says they're interested in doing a rally or a demonstration, they should start with the NYPD first. They need to coordinate with the NYPD. The only time they get a permit or even come to the street activity permit office is if a portion of it is occurring on a pedestrian plaza. Then they get a permit from us. But everything else is managed by the NYPD. If it starts or ends in a park or on the street, or on, sorry, or on the plaza, that's when they would need a permit from us or the parks department. But everything else about the coordination of that rally, that demonstration, that march, happens with the NYPD. And um, sometimes the NYPD sends them to you, you send them back to us, but it's really, it's the NYPD that manages that process. Um, let's see, single block festivals remain the same, but we did write into our rules that it's 90 days. In the past, it used to still be the December 31st of the year before, but in our rules, we put in 90 days. Street festivals are still the same. It's still December 31st. Nothing has changed there. Um, the moratorium is still in place. 
If it did not happen in the previous year, can't happen this year. If you didn't apply with the, before December 31st, you've lost it moving forward. Uh, the moratorium is still in place. Plaza events are new because the plazas were defined as being plazas, and so now plaza events have their own categories depending on where they are and the size and um, location to city centers, et cetera. Production event is kind of new. This used to be what we called event um, extra small, but it's specifically production now. It is just loading in and out of a venue. It is not a tent. It is not anything else. It is literally queuing on a sidewalk to get in and out of venue or a truck parked that's loading in and out of a venue. That's all production is. Everything else falls under event, street events. And street events vary in size from small, medium to large. Small being the use of either a sidewalk or a curb lane, medium being the use of a sidewalk and a curb lane, and then large being a street closure, which would go to our deadlines. So block parties, just a reminder, 60 days. It's no longer 90 days, so no one should be late because they were used to 90 days, but you'd be surprised. Um, 60 days is the new. Cleanups, 60 days. Farmers market, 60 days. Health fairs, 30 days. Mobile units, 60 days. Religious events, 60 days. Plaza events depend on the size of the plaza. Uh, press conferences, rallies, demonstrations, they're 10 days, but I mean, they're First Amendment rights, so. Uh, production events are 10 days. Single block festivals are 90 days. Street events, depending on the size, and street festivals are still December 31st of the preceding year. So this is kind of a quick breakdown of the street events and what their deadlines are. If it's a small, it's 14 days, medium 30 days, large 45 days. We did try our best to give you as much time as possible to comment on these types of events. This is kind of where we fell. I think when we proposed the rules, these were like 60, 45, and 30, but this is how it ended up coming out after the rule change. And then this is for the plaza levels. These are the deadlines for them, so it depends on the level that you're on and the sizes of the plazas that you plan on utilizing. Okay, so permit process. We are all familiar with this, but yet somehow it seems to get messed up sometimes. So applicant applies online. We have the, the ability to comment. There are assess a fee if there is a fee, which is basically everything except for a block party and a cleanup and a religious event. And then uh, CECM staff, depending on the size of it, attends the event. Everyone can apply online. Please direct them to apply online. I know a lot of people sometimes come in and work with you, but they just need to apply online through our website for the application. And then this stuff happens. I do want to go through this so that we're all on the same page as to when you guys can see the application, when you should start commenting, because sometimes we're like, we can't see it. And we're like, yes, you can. So <laughs> the SAPO begins the review process. That's the very first thing that happens. The moment the applicant puts the application in the system, you guys can see it. No matter what my team does, it's in, it's in this weird quasi state, but no matter what they do, you can see it the exact moment the applicant puts in the application. Once my team sees the application, they pull the application and it goes into review status. During that time, you can also still see it, but even before it goes into review status, you can still see that application. So you can begin to comment on it. The moment it goes in, you actually start seeing it in your queue to comment on it, those daily emails that you receive. So once that happens, we, we, we want you to start commenting on it. We want you to reach out to them and tell them what other additional requirements they may have, like signatures for block parties or street festivals, like come in and meet with us because your event is coming up. Those kinds of things is when you can start commenting on it. The moment my team pulls that application and moves it into pending status, the applicant receives a notification telling them all the things that they're required to do. Here's the contact information for your community board. Here's the contact information for your precinct. You said you were having pyrotechnics. Here's the contact number for the FDNY. Please understand that the moment they receive, they pull that application, that happens. So I know you guys get a lot, oh, SAPO hasn't contacted us. Oh, we never know anything. That is automatically generated from the system. It's not turned off. It automatically goes to the applicant and they can see it. Not only that, if the applicant ever were to just even log back into their account and check on their application, all that information is on the summary page, on the first page of the application, so they can see who they need to contact and the answer to all of their questions. So that automatically happens. After that initial pulling and review, our team will go ahead and review it and will notify all the additional agencies. So I know that you guys pull it, but sometimes you'll get a notification from my team that says, hey, look at this application as well depending on who it is. So that's the additional notification. We notify not just you guys, but NYPD, 
um, the bid sometimes, Department of Transportation, depending on who it is, will notify them through the system as a reminder, here, can you take a look at this? Because the applicant has said, I'm doing all these other things. And just a notification in general to you guys to say, hey, we've start work, started working on that application. So after that happens, then you guys, the community board, plaza partners may request additional information. We obviously expect that at the beginning of the phase, but for us, after we notify you, that's when we're gonna start bugging you for that information. So that to ensure that the applicant gets their, you know, their permit in a reasonable amount of time. So SAPO themselves may require additional information, especially for those plaza events or those street closures. We want more data than just, I'm having an event. We require production schedules, we require site plans, anything for a full street closure. We require that for, a farm, for any actually thing that we do where we close an entire street, we're asking for things like site plans, for things like what is actually happening. Because we found out that some of these block parties are actually selling things at them, which they shouldn't be. Why do you have booths at a block party? Those are some questions that we begin to ask. Oh, well, I've been selling stuff for years. Well, did you know you can't sell at a block party? It's not a block party. So that's when we kind of find out and have better understanding of these things. And I know that you guys get are getting a lot of frustrated individuals that are telling you, well, I've been doing this for years, and SAPO says it's not what, it was, it, what I've been, but it's a block party. That's because we've had a conversation with them, and for years they've been selling rides at their block party, and we're saying you can't do that. Block parties are free and open to the public. If you were doing that, then we would require additional information from you, additional requirements from you. So please understand that we're not trying to be mean about it, but we are trying to make sure that it's permitted correctly and it's permitted under the correct event type. And a lot of these folks may have been, you know, kind of knew what they were doing or thought they were getting away with something, I don't know. Um, some of them just honestly didn't know. But we are working with them to try to get things categorized correctly and in the easiest way possible. I'm giving them as many options as we can to let them achieve their goal without you know, having to pay astronomical fees. And sometimes that's worked out and sometimes that hasn't. <laughs> but, um, but we are, are trying our best to work with them. And when you do get that feedback, that's kind of what that's about. So we may require additional information. Other agencies may require additional information. As long as the applicant fulfills all the requirements, gets all the support permits that they need to, um, changes their application in the way that's necessary to get a permit. If it's required, we would assess them. If not, um, then they would potentially get the uh, permit. If they, we assess them, they have to pay the fee and then they get the permit. Um, and that's basically the application process. But just remember that you are gonna get calls <laughs> because we are trying to fully identify what's happening on the street. And again, we're happy to work with you, with the applicant to get things permitted correctly. So this is just general information. If you guys deny them, it's automated through the system. Anything that you put there within the denial field is sent to the applicant. They have the opportunity to address that. That's all sent to them in an email. They have five days to address it in writing directly to me. If I also deny them, then they also have the ability to appeal my denial to my uh, executive director. And then if their final answer is no, then it's no. If their final answer is yes, then they can move forward with the event. And some of you guys have gone through that process with me. Some of you haven't, but that is the process that we go through if you guys deny. These are some other things that you should just be a reminder and aware of that we do require additional pieces of information in order for an individual to get a permit and then also a requirement after the permit has been issued. For example, we require that 15-foot fire lane for any closure. Please do not put your bouncy house in the middle of the street. There has to be a 15-foot emergency lane clear for emergency vehicles to go down. Um, we do require that they clean up and recycle. There can be fines and rules and regulations with regards to this. The sanitation department does have access to our system, and they can identify the individual who was on that street with that permit. So there are some cases where some folks have outstanding balances with the Department of Sanitation, and we get that list. And so they need to make that right if they plan on having another um, permit with us, but sanitation does uh, bill you if they have to go down there and clean up after you. SAPO does require a minimum of a million dollar insurance policy. The only time we don't require this is for those block parties and cleanups, and that's also why block parties are supposed to be just block parties and not festivals and not music concerts and all the other things that people would like them to be. It's because we don't require that million dollar insurance policy. And we do require it for things that those categories really are, like special events, where there's a potential for more um, individuals to potentially be harmed or, or bad things to happen. 
So uh, that is why that million dollar insurance policy is in place. And then the approval of our office doesn't necessarily re mean approval from other agencies. That's also key because if we did not know that you were roasting the pig, then there's no way we knew to direct you to the health department. And if the health department shows up and shuts you down and finds you, you cannot hold out your SAPO permit and say, well, I have a SAPO permit, and they said I could do it. Because we didn't say you could do it because we didn't know you were roasting a pig. So that's the kind of what that means, that's, which is also the reason why I've tasked my team with truly finding out what's happening at these events so that should someone show up, it doesn't get shut down because everything there was permitted correctly. Okay, Manhattan. So this is just an overview in general of the permits that occurred. I should say Brooklyn, I'm so sorry. I'm starting to think I have the wrong presentation. I do, sorry guys. <laughs> Can I get, just pause for just a quick second? I'm so sorry. Dot is correct. We have a new version of the database coming out. Um, we haven't made it publicly accessible because we want to iron out all the kinks. The functionality remains the same. We hope that you find it more modern because we haven't changed the system, the, frame, the framework for it since uh, 2009, to be quite honest, or 2010. So the flow of it's going to be very Windows-based, and I'll go into that when we get the screenshots. But um, one of the things that Don referenced was you should now see a change up in your notifications. And have you noticed that? There's just more information. So those daily notifications about events going on in your community board, we are now displaying what you see when you sign on to the database, which includes informational events, or FYI. So things like that NYPD is responsible for, film events, and I think we're showing parks events as well. Do you want me to get going? Yeah. yeah. How's that? All right. So I don't think I need to do an overview if everyone has used the database. Um, but once we feel solid, meaning me and my small technical team, that the database is stable, the new version of it, I'll distribute this uh, soft copy. And so that way you'll see the link and you can bookmark it because that will be the new link for the database. All right. The daily notifications we went over, any questions on that? So when you log on, this is the first thing you see, you'll see basically three tiles. One is for reviewing your upcoming events. The next one is what's happening today. That's actually <coughs> brand new. It's sort of a quick, quick and dirty sort of like what's happening and it'll open up the map in your community board and it'll show the different events that are going on. And then we have the search events feature as well. So this is simple navigational tips. We always will have the search options available. I think right now in the current system, you have to actually link, you have to actually click on a link that says search. This will always just sort of be there statically, hang out where you can change the dates, and I believe um, the status of the events and whatnot. Today's events, when you click on that from the prior tile there, happening today, that's what I was referring to. You'll, so you'll see the map there, and you'll see the list of events. For upcoming events, so this is the change up of what you do right now. Right now, it's just one long running list. We now have a multi-tab approach to it. So upcoming events that are SAPO related, that you actually chime in on for recommending approval or denying or whatnot, or abstaining, that's on the first tab. The second tab will be informational events. So you can toggle back and forth between that. And I'm sure once we roll this out, you guys will have questions and we'll field any of the questions that you have. So the functionality still remains the same, color coded to represent the agency. You click on the event ID or the name of the event and it'll open up the summary page. Well, let me backtrack a little bit. So a couple of other tips. Because we're taking this multi-tab approach, you know how you open up one event and it opens up that summary and then you have to close out of that window and open up another event? We allow two to be open up at the same time now that we have this tabular approach. So for example, if you click on a SAPO event, it'll open up that event in the summary and you'll see the tab representing that event ID. You can go back to the informational or review upcoming events tab and open up a secondary event and that'll open up the summary for that event. So you can have two going on at the same time within you know, one window, so to speak. Oh, the other thing too, keep going back to this. Sometimes you'll see a, a notation of like a red mark 
this is violations that Don was talking about. Um, if the applicant under that email had a prior violation from a prior event, you'll see the violations tab flagged. And you'll, you can look and see what kind of violation it was. So that's sim simple navigation. When you open up an event, you open up the summary page. And that summary page will show the same stuff that you've been seeing before. Um, as Don pointed out, same functionality. You guys get to see the event sometimes before Don's team will even see it when it's sitting in the application queue up for SAPO. So you're allowed to view the documents as usual. You're allowed to chime in with your recommendations. And you, know, you, can, you have enough information to actually contact the event sponsor if you wanted to. So that's the summary page. Files being uploaded, oftentimes these guys will, these guys, these applicants will upload documents that are relevant, you know, site plans or whatnot to their, their application. This is where you get to view them. The icons are a little different, so, you know, it's, it's basically caught up to 2010 technology, so if you just hover over some of the icons, you'll be able to see what, what's happening with them. So, like, there's like a three-person sort of silhouette on the far right. That'll indicate what other agencies that document is viewable to. So, for example, if it's viewable to bids, you say about NYBD, you would see all three or four of those agencies listed. If you wanted to upload a document, and I don't know if you folks actually do that, I'm not familiar enough with the process, but same functionality. You just have to choose what type of document it is. I think it defaults to other, but, and that way you can upload it and actually indicate what other agencies you want that document viewable to. So any questions on that? I should have started off with a comedy routine. Um, so the next tab is just um, your recommendation for approvals or denials. You will also see other comments by other agencies, including SAPA. Um, and again, it's the same running list. So you can abstain, you can recommend approval, recommend denial, and whatnot. And then the final tab is violations. So have you guys been noticing violations already on there? You should, if you haven't. but Check it out, it's in the current system. What you'll see, if the event is passed and it's approved already and it, you know, it's a few weeks later and there was a violation on that event, you would see it here and you could actually see what specific violation was listed. If I, Paresh Patel, as an applicant, had a prior event last year and I had some sort of violation, um, you would see that event ID listed. And you would see, I don't believe you actually see the specific violation for past events. But because it happened in your community board, you can do a search on that event to find out specifically what that violation was. Make sense? And the final thing we have is maps. So you can always see the map of an event provided that the applicant actually put in a valid street address. If it's invalid, you're not going to get a map for it. You will also notice that there's conflicts. So the map defaults to just the mapping of that street or intersecting streets that that event is taking place. If you click on view conflicts, you'll be able to see other events that are nearby or conflicting with, the, with said event. And you'll see the list of events on top. And that's it. Any questions? You said we can't see the violations, what the violations are? You can. Oh, I thought you said you You Yeah, I kind of muddled that a little bit. You can see <laughs> violations for any event, technically. But say you're on an event that, hasn't, that is yet to come, right? So you're looking at an event coming up. And that applicant had a prior violation. You will see that event ID of the prior event, just like that. But you would, have to op you would have to do a search on that event ID to find out what that specific okay. violation was. And, and um, will that violation be deleted from the system if the applicant has, then, has since addressed it? It's just that they ever, if, OK. Not only that, um, the violation remains on the applicants no matter what happens. But if, as long as they have written a letter to address the violations, that will be uploaded and it'll be noted in the comment section. Okay. So if you do go to that comment section, then you would be able to see that violation 
as well as any other documents, and it'll be listed as response to violation or otherwise they're all coded correctly. So. Is, is there a process by which SAPO determines whether or not that response is a valid response or? We, <laughs> we, we do reach out to the community board and others and we do bring the applicants in and have meetings with them. The ones that do have violations, we do meet with them. We do invite the community board to be a part of that conversation so that they're aware of the concerns that we have, especially if an applicant or an individual has multiple violations and some of them do. But we do try to address that within the next year um, prior to them or after they apply for a new event or activity, we do have that conversation. But we make all of that information, no matter what, available to the community boards. It's uploaded their response, and you can review it, and you can also comment on that as well. There are some applicants that actually legitimately address it, and we have those conversations with you, but there are some where their claims do not necessarily match what the other agencies say, and that's when we need a meeting uh, to sit down and have that conversation with the applicant. So this is actually Brooklyn permits. Apologies about that. So. In, uh, in 2017, we permitted 1,765 events in the borough of Brooklyn. And the majority of them were block parties, surprise, surprise. As to which, 56% of all the block parties permitted citywide actually occur in Brooklyn. This is our highest possible number uh, here. And of the 170, 1,764 SAPO permits that were approved in the borough of Brooklyn, 1,149 were block parties, and that's about 65%. So you can, I mean, block parties are community-based events. Those are the ones of the folks that come in and meet with you, which is why it's really important that you work with us and that we have those open dialogue and that conversation to make sure that they're permitted correctly, that they're not doing crazy stuff there, um, and that they're actually abiding by the rules and regulations of the city. And it's, it's just, hands down, the most permits that you're gonna get. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it's not getting less. Even though we created that health fair category in hopes that we reduce the number of block parties, that's not the case. In 2016, it was 1,118. In 2017, it's 1,149, so it's still increasing. And this is just at a glance, the highest number of events that you guys have Blog parties, then religious events. I don't think we're really surprised about any of this. Street events are next. Those are those closures. Kind of why I went into a little bit more detail about what street events are. Uh, t tents on sidewalks, all those promotional vans in a curb lane, all that stuff. Those are street events. Um, plaza events, we are having more plazas open in Brooklyn. So more plaza events are occurring and you guys please, you can comment on those. Production events, that's those loading in and out of venues. A lot more venues are becoming active in Brooklyn where people are requesting these types of um, activity, Porter Sands and the Curb Lane, that kind of stuff. And then uh, single block festivals, and we all know about single block festivals. Um, just to put it in perspective, even though you guys were like 1,700, et cetera, um, overall, SAPO issued 5,209 permits in general across all boroughs last year. And this just was kind of a quick breakdown of how we compare to other agencies so you have a general idea. Obviously, the Parks Department's way out there because they have their athletic fields as well as just their regular special events. Um, film, our friends at film. Mm -hmm. um, just, just so you're aware, this DOT number technically isn't a permitted event, but that's their construction and other embargoes that they place in our system to help us deconflict issues that could be um, uh, conflicting with the applications that we have in the system. Just as a quick reminder, film versus SAPO. I know you guys get a lot of complaints. They closed my street, I had no warning. You get warning from us. <laughs> so we're always happy to help you, try to identify what the issue is, try to work with you and get you a contact with the film department of who issued the permit, because you guys don't have as much information as we do sometimes with regard to that. But more than likely, if you had no idea it was common, it was probably due to a film closure as opposed to something that SAPO approved and permitted. Um, we also have our Find Events feature, so please feel free to use this. Feel free to um, direct individuals to this. We have open data, which gives you historical data in general about permits. I think it goes back as far as 2008 now of the events that we've permitted, and you can search open data and it has more fields. But if you wanted to do a quick search of what is actually happening within the next month or coming up, you can do that straight on our website here. You click on the Find Events feature, and then you can filter your events by event type, event um, borough, 
um, all these different uh, restrictions here and get double, double, del, del, delve down into where you actually want the event to occur. And then when you click on it, you get a map. So that doesn't occur in open data, but you can actually see a map of where the actual activity is happening. And I want to bring your attention to, it shows you the affected side closure. So there are a lot of times you say, my block was closed and it's ridiculous. And we're like, we didn't close your block. And you can see that we actually only authorized a curb lane or a sidewalk, but then they maybe decided to take the full street. But this is actually what they're permitted for in our system, not what they have chosen to do. So this kind of helps as well. We have also come up with the agency permitting guide. A link was sent out to you. I forgot to bring the brochure today, sorry guys. But if you want a hard copy, you can always stop by our office and we're gonna try to get those out to you as well as I come and visit you and give my presentation to your community. I'll bring the book with me. Uh, but this is actually great because it helps you to help them. It has a quick guide to all the other agencies. For example, DEP's in there with the permits they have for generators. Um, health department's in there with their temporary food service certificate and requirements and fees and costs associated with it. So it kind of gives you at a glance, you can flip through and find, oh, what are you trying to do? This is the agency you need to contact. This is actually what it's gonna take for you to get that support permit that you need to have that activity at your event. Looking forward. So here's some stuff that we're working on to better our relationship with you guys, with the applicants and so on. Um, we're gonna continue to add updates to the, the database. We're going to have a place where the applicant documents are automatically uploaded um, and uh, standardizing uh, preliminary and final vendor lists. We actually already did this. So I know that a lot of the times, especially for street festivals, single block festivals and health fairs, a lot of the time, the applicant is like, SAPO didn't give us the documents. We don't have the documents to fill out. They didn't tell us about it. Well, actually, this week, we fixed that, and we did the automation. So if they log in, once again, if they're interested in their event and they log in, it's right there on the summary page. They can click the information documents, they can download it them, and they can print them. Also, the moment they apply for the application, before it even hits the system, the window opens up with the information, like magic and they have to click and close it. So they had to have seen the documents that are required to process their application correctly. And if they, once again, printed them out then, or once they finished and clicked out of that window, they have ample opportunity to go back in, click on the link, download the relevant documents, and complete the process successfully. So again, if, if they're asking you, I didn't see it, I, it's on their application, it lives there. As long as they log in, they can have access to these documents. Um, host one-on-one -on -one meetings, that's what I'm talking about, coming out and seeing you. And info sessions for city agencies and city partners, kind of like what we're doing here right now. Um, manage applicant expectations, create event permitting checklists, we're working on those. Clarifying community versus SAPO roles, we're working on those. Um, greater clarity on events like creating an agency permitting guide, we did that. And hosting annual event permitting info sessions for producers, we have two for producers coming up that we're gonna be working on, we just haven't scheduled them yet. And allow applicants to post comments and make requests through the database system. This is something that we're really gonna be working on this year because we also often get a different story from the applicants that you guys get, and you guys get a different story than we do. So we're gonna be requesting that if they want changes to their application, if they wanna do something and request something of us, that they do it through the system. So it's available not just to us, but to you, and it increases that transparency that I was talking about. So they can literally, legitimately request it through the system. You can see it, we can see it, and you can see our response back to them. And that's it. Any questions? Um, I apologize in advance because I have uh, several questions and um, um, I'll do them quickly as I can. Um, I know this is harder than automation. I have an IT background, but if, if there's anything you can do to get better event names, um, I don't, you know, as, as you know, Fitzroy uh, handles these in my office, but I do look at the daily email, and if I get an event number, an event date, a filing date, and an event that is annual block party, I know nothing. Um, so I guess that's just a comment. Um, my understanding, uh, for a number of years is that um, if an organization uh, has a street festival, a single day street festival on multiple days, that's the same as a multi-day or multi-block. Am I incorrect? 
That's, that's correct. So they, they would actually, it wouldn't be a single block festival, it would be a street festival. It would be labeled as such. So if the Church of Living Good with God has an event on five Sunday afternoons, that's, a, that's multi-block, or multi-day, and they should file by the end of the previous year? If it it's, depends, is it consecutive days? No. No, then it wouldn't be. We're so, talking about consecutive days. So I've been operating under a misconception. Um, you mentioned your production events. Are those, um, so I have a, a number of theaters um, in my district. And are your production events independent from the ones that are approved by the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment? Yeah, that's what I was talking about, the film department. That, that's, that's the difference in our permits. Um, where was it, where was it? That's definitely who I was talking about, film. That's this. So, me, there you go. Yep. So uh, they are completely different than us. They're, they both live in the same system. Those are the inf on the informational tab. Actually, I don't even know if they even show up. If they show up on the informational tab. So informational tab under yellow, that's film. What, what type of production events do you have? We have loading in and out of a venue that doesn't relate to a movie screening. Like theater so, events. So Robin, the, in my district, one of them is, is for Log Bomber. Um, a big truck comes in to unload uh, uh, equipment to set up for a Log Bomber party. And so they get the permit, and then they come back to dismantle it a couple days later. It's another permit. Or, or for loading in and out, yep. Or loading in and out of a venue for, um, I don't know, a bar mitzvah, a wedding. Okay, okay. Anything like that. Anything that's outside the realm of film. Okay. And the, the theater is hit or miss. Sometimes they'll apply for us. Sometimes they'll go through film. If they go through film, they don't have to pay. If they go through us, there are fees associated with it. So people game the system. Okay, thank you. That was, I think, hopefully pain, painless. But uh, back to, I do want to address your comment on the better names. I, we don't control that. They, we control the event type and that's it. They make up their own names, which is why we get into that conversation of, I can't permit Jennifer's, Jennifer's birthday party. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we have the comment, conversation with them to say, if you meant you wanted to have a street closure for your community, and at someone's house they had a birthday party, that's fine, but we can't close the block for Jennifer's birthday party. My question is about the, um, the questionnaire for the permitting. Um, I've, I've talked to you about this before, but the question about fire is so um, strange, actually, and specific. And I wonder if that change has been made on your end, if there's a question that's more general about intentions of the fire. We have not changed any of our, our questions in our database yet for this year, but there are several that we are working with the other agencies to change. That's one of them. We're also working with the state um, DOT um, for information regarding their jurisdiction versus our jurisdiction. So there's several different agencies that we're working with. We're going to make all the changes at once. We just haven't made that change yet. But I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> Thanks. And then um, if I can do one more. Um, you know, the change in the weekend walks kind of got a little bit funky because it now means that, that organizations have more than the allowable number of events per year because it used to be, you know, you're allowed to have, is it two or three? Oh, you're talking about multi-day, multi-block? So th that's the mm -hmm. street festival type activities. Well, no, no, I'm, I'm talking about just the number of, of SAPO applications an organization can have in a year. They're allowed endless. The only restriction for us technically is on street festivals or street fairs. So they can't have more than one, more than two per agency per year. So EIN number per year. And but, the, but the problem is with that is that at the end of the day, DOT is the applicant for that, not them. DOT is the sponsor, not them. So they're actually using DOT's information, not their own. They're the producer of the event. Okay. That, that's fine. Um, do you, in a state boat, do you offer any guidelines on the number of times a major street can be closed for a year? Because that's one of our struggles is just the onus being on us to say somebody else already closes Coney Island Avenue, um, we, you know, two or three times a year. We can't close Coney Island Avenue once a month. So I know that other community, I can, I can speak to what other community boards have done. SAPO doesn't our policy, well, we have different, different policies in place. For example, one of our policies is try not to have one person have the same block party every single week. So we try to request that they have them 60 days apart, which then conflicts with some of your community boards because you're like, let them have them every weekend if they want to. 
We try not to do that because we don't think it's fair to have that street closed every single weekend or every, what, the first weekend of every month. I mean, I, I don't think it's fair. We try to have those internal policies. Um, what, we, what we ask of you guys to do is that if you can get together as a community board and have a ruling to say that, you know, within our community, we would rather that no street be closed more than X amount of times a year, and if you have a resolution to that effect, that actually is something that we can support wholeheartedly. Okay. We love it when you upload your resolutions, because okay. we can stand behind those. It's a board resolution. Please use that upload feature. Upload them so that we can support that, um, whatever it is. And especially at the beginning of the year, I asked my team kind of to reach out and say, hey, because some community boards do have that, we, and some precincts have that as well. No more than five block parties on a weekend. And so if we are aware of those regulations that are in place, or those policies that you guys have in place, we will 100% support them. Can I do one more? Yeah. Um, finally, um, the other thing that I've asked for is um, a, a better heads up when SAPO is going to make a determination that is counter to our recommendation. So rather than seeing that you've denied something we approved or vice versa in the system, if there could be um, some contact with the community board before that decision is overturned so we can have some dialogue about why we stood where we you know did and and why you have to um, supersede that yeah and and we we try our best to, to reach out to you and have that conversation i know a couple of years ago that did happen with you yeah. i know um <laughs> no, again it wasn't my decision but yes okay <laughs> Dawn, I feel like I'm one of those people that developed a personal relationship with you um, and <laughs> Dyke appreciate of Dyke of Lights. Um, can't even, I don't even want to talk about it. But um, So my, my question to you is tonight, coincidentally, our transportation committee is going to be reviewing our festivals and our weekend walks applications. Um, and so weekend walks is a little bit different this year and, and, and I think some of the rules to us are still a little bit fuzzy. Um, but we, in, in terms of, sometimes we get questions. One of the applicants for weekend walks had requested that sanitation services not be provided the evening of, but rather the following day. Um, and you had mentioned that earlier. Is there in the rules that somewhere that says that sanitation services, is there a requirement um, or is it part of, the, part of the permit? They are still required and, and we've had several we should really invite you to those weekend walk meetings that we have so that you guys are aware of, of what we go over with them because we do really tell them what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they are hot, they're held to the same requirements as any other event. Um, a lot of them say that sometimes the PD closes the street before they want them to and that it has a negative effect on the community and we are working with PD to fix that. Some of them say that sanitation never comes after their event and where I, my point to them was it is your responsibility to clean up. You need to contact sanitation and have them, you know, pay the fees associated with it. You guys are a program. You receive money from the city. Um, so you have money to work with. Put that into your budget. But I, they can't, I don't know that they can request that of you, but that is a part of what they have to figure out how, how they do. Okay. But to hold the services till after their event, I'm not really sure how that helps them because yeah, they're supposed to be clean before right. they start. I don't think the board would support that uh, because it does get a little bit messy. But we are going to take... Um, we did decide we will have an interagency meeting and, and invite you down um, with the applicant and, and kind of work out those kings. But I was curious on the violation section. Are those violations, um, they cover multiple agencies? Is it also the police department? Multiple agencies. So any agency that tells us that there is a violation, we have an enforcement director who's not here today. He's on vacation. And he actually coordinates with all the other agencies. Sometimes there's a full task force that includes DOI, sent, um, SLA, uh, all the other uh, agencies that have hold permits in conjunction with that event. And they go through and take a look at the event to ensure that it's abiding by the rules and regulations. And if they write citations to any vendor or individual, then they'll let us know and we'll put that in as a part of their violation. And so it covers all agencies. And when you see the violation, it will tell what agencies it's associated with and what the violation was. Okay, because we also review for certain if we have issues, 311 data, if there were noise complaints. Um, one thing that's been missing that we've advocated for that I know is not under your purview, but I, I'm just curious, I'll, I'll ask the question, is access to 911 data. Um, we had a block party last year. We had two applications for the same block, and on the second application, I didn't think it was an issue. I didn't hear anything, but we heard from residents saying that the police department was out three times, and I had already asked the police department with their issues. They weren't aware 
but when they did a 911 check, there were three calls, fireworks, there was a fight, and we denied it, you also supported that. So it just made us think at the board um, in asking for, um, and I guess that's a broader discussion yeah. for, for access to 911 data, but I'll just throw it out it there. Feed in automatically. We only hear from 311 when there's concerns regarding us. Okay. We don't even yeah. get their regular data. Okay, thanks. Hmm. All right, Henry Butler, CB3, Beverly Stuyvesant. Um, my assistant DM is Beryl Lines. He mostly deals with this, so can you, email that PowerPoint yes. over to us? I will share this PowerPoint. Um, I can send it, yeah. And they'll distribute it to everyone. Okay, second thing is, um, we get a lot of block parties. Yes. Yes, I know you know. <laughs> a lot of times, why does it, they're not getting approved, the notice that it's been approved a week or two before the actual event? Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? That is just our policy. So we do not issue permits until two weeks prior to the event, specifically block parties. And the, the last, sometimes we get PD comments on it, yay, everything's great. And then a week before, they're like, no, our bad, we take that back. Mm -hmm. And we have in the past had to reject applications and that never goes well. So um, we have found out that it's better and safer two weeks before, PD usually knows how things are going within the community and then we issue the permits then. Okay, only, only real, I'm bringing it up because it is, you know, we get so many calls it hasn't been approved, it hasn't been approved, and I'm and trying to buy this, I'm trying to buy that, we don't want to spend this money, and then the last second, it's been canceled, and they're out of their money. But, but that's also part of the reason why we don't issue it until we know. We can't, we, in general, we always tell them, I know that the community board said okay, I know that everything looks fine, but we're not issuing that permit until two, day, two weeks so before. Two weeks, that's the policy. Two weeks is our policy. Okay. Awesome. And, if, and if you didn't get it for two weeks, that's because we still are waiting for a comment from the NYPD, and sometimes they don't give it to us until the day before, and we're like, we have to have this comment, because block parties are the one event where, because of the fact that there's no insurance, because of the fact that there's nothing mm -hmm. else, we have to have the community board comment as well as the NYPD comment to make sure that they're actually gonna safely close that block and that they're aware that the community is planning to close that block. Okay, I'd definitely would like for you to come and do a presentation oh, please. at one of our board meetings. Yes. Not this long, but. <laughs> It'll be shorter. This is just more detail for you guys. Okay. That's all this is. Thank you. Good morning, Don. Um, Good morning. My name is Eddie Mark. I'm with uh, CB13 down in Coney Island. And of course, uh, one of our um, permits uh, that asked for a hot rod and tattoo day, and it was denied this year. Uh, we understand that they, in the past, applied it as a block party, and this year, for some reason, it was canceled uh, because it was denied by SAPO, and we were just trying to figure out why. I can look into that. I mean, okay. it could be a lot of reasons why. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's more that. They, um, it if, if it was a run, maybe we told them that they're not supposed to apply with us because it's a race and it's a oh, run. No, it's not a run. It was a, a, a what do you call it? It was um, a show. It was like um, a display, a car show display. Oh yeah, yeah. car oh displays. <laughs> you know, we we've had this conversation with folks, and we we never really understand what they're doing until they actually tell us, because it's not a block party. A block party is not a car show. A block a car show is a special event. Oh. <laughs> we've been going about this. And so if you're gonna, you know, have cars there, that, that's not a block party. A block party is a closure for the community to get together. No, nowhere in there does it include cars, you know, and all that other stuff. So that, the classification is probably what we went back to them with, and then they were like, well, wait a minute, I'm not gonna do all that, so. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right, good. So I know there's a certain block in my district that gives a jazz, free jazz concert. What is that, what is that considered? That's a special event, a special event. <laughs> it's a concert. Okay. I'll let them know. <laughs> and, and also, um, I know that you really don't, don't deal with the parks permits. Do you guys really deal with it or you just let them <clears throat> deal with it? Parks department is with parks department. The only time it impacts us is if they're using the curb lane adjacent to the park. Okay. We right. don't, and even, if they're, and even if we get a permit to, for some, someone to use the curb lane uh, connecting to the park, mm -hmm. we always have the conversation with the parks department. It's not always reciprocated, mm -hmm. but we reach out to parks to make sure that there is a parks permit if we're going to um, permit the curb lane. Okay, and uh, it's just that, that there was a situation or there's one that's coming up, it's uh, with the parks department. And basically, it's an amphitheater um, where oh, yes. it's near on Astor Levy Park down by, um, what do you call it? West I know Street. where it is. Nice. You don't have and, to explain Okay, and, <laughs> and there, in the past, um, basically, uh, it was closed down because um, there's no sound permitted when there's a temple there. And this year, um, there's an event that's happening with Amplified Sound, and we're trying to tell them that you can't do it, but yet 
they've been doing for the last 20 years. So the question is, does it come in now and say the grandfathered in, or? SAPO yeah. doesn't do grandfathered in. I don't know if the okay. Parks Department does, um, but we can definitely help you reach out to the okay. folks in the parks and get you a meeting sure. yeah. so that you guys can have that discussion and, and so that everybody's on the same page with regard to impact to the community, because that needs to be addressed. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Well, thank you. My name is Shanique Meejim. I work with Dawn. I, I am the associate director. I actually handle the plazas within your area. So if you ever need anything pertaining to plazas, only. And I'm the person for you. Uh, I'm Stefan Grabowskis. I do external relations for CCM and SAPO. I met some of you at community board meetings. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All right, so now we're gonna move on to our uh, next item for discussion, which is a uh, discussion with New York State Liquor Authority Chair Vincent Bradley uh, and Michael Jones. Yes, come on in. Yes, just have a seat. Introduce yourselves. And, uh... Hi, I'm uh, Vince Bradley. I'm the chairman of the Liquor Authority. And <coughs> I'm Michael Jones, the deputy CEO. So I don't think I've been here. Uh, I was here. I've been in the job about three years. It'll be three years in May, and I, the first year I got here to speak with all of you. I don't know how many of you were there. Were there then? And last year I wasn't able to get here. But I we're going around the, the uh, city trying to meet with all the community board representatives that we can. Um, we just had met with uh, a group in Manhattan a couple days ago, or last week, I should say, and. Now we're here with you. I'm basically here to answer any questions you may have. I'll give you a few updates about what's changed recently. Um, we have recently um, hired an executive director or executive deputy commissioner uh, up in Albany. His name's Sharif Kabir. Um, and he's in the executive offices and he's dealing with most of the deputy commissioners as a supervisor. And he's also dealing with any new legislation that may be coming down the line, whether it's being proposed by the governor or um, through either of the houses and um, certainly dealing with both of the houses in that regard. And he's also uh, available for questions. Um, we are currently in the process of designing, we're, not, we're almost past the design stage of a new website that hopefully will be much more user friendly, particularly for the community boards. Um, that was a long time coming because I can't even use the one we have now <laughs> myself and I'm there every day. Um, so we're spending a lot of time and money on that. We have a, a young lady who is extremely savvy in the social media area um, who is uh, basically taking the lead on that along with Sharif Kabir and our public information officer, uh, Bill Crowley. And like I said, that's, that's in the late stages of design, so hopefully in the next few months you should see that up and running. And we are open to any suggestions you may have, um, so you're welcome to submit those in writing. Um, Mike is, a, is going to um, be sending around basically an offer to do that. There'll be a hard deadline about when we, when we need those by, but you're welcome to put some in there. Um, and, and if we can do it and it's cost effective, we will do it. Uh, and as you're all aware, Mike is the liaison with the community boards. Um, the one thing that I do want to stress before I open it up for some questions is I get hundreds of emails a day um, from various sources. And frequently, and I've asked Mike to do this, and I know he has done it, is to ask the community boards in particular not to send me emails. The reason for that is, one, this is why we have Mike. He is the liaison there. And two, if you're sending me something that is actually very important, and it, it's, a, it's a license application that's about to go before the board, it's going to get lost with me. The best thing you can do is make sure he has it, because he will make sure it ends up in the right hands, which will then mean I definitively will get it before I vote on anything. 
Um, and the same thing, you can send it to the deputy commissioner or whoever the licensing um, outreach person is there. We have a community board email, Mike? <coughs> we actually have two, uh, which I'd just like to mention. One is CB licensing, and the other one's CB complaints. And the idea is for licensing issues, you should use the licensing email address. I review it, and so does the licensing staff. CB complaints is more for the uh, current licensees that are up for uh, you know, the, the renewals and you have problems and issues. That's more of an enforcement issue. So the idea is if it's a present licensee and you have a problem with them, you would use the CB complaints mailbox. Because what I've seen, uh, I think it's mainly Queens, where they just send it to me, to both email addresses, and, and it gets confusing because if I'm looking at a, a licensing issue and complaints, I'm not sure if the person in licensing is, is putting it in the right place. So the idea is to have two separate email addresses that are reviewed uh, daily. And that will guarantee that, that whatever you submit ends up in front of us when we review an application. And that's the only reason I, I can't take these emails because it's, I'm not, it's not just Brooklyn, it's, Queen, it's all over the state I'm getting emails from. And, and I really, every time I see them come in and I don't have time to read them, I feel like that I'm missing something or somebody's not being heard and that's the last thing I want to happen. Um, you know, we deal with 62 counties in the state and, and it gets overwhelming and I realize everybody wants me to see it and I will see it. I can guarantee you that. We always, we, I don't know if you've ever watched a board meeting, but I have a stack of papers that high for every board meeting and I read every page of them before the board meeting. So, um, and they make sure I see everything that is submitted. Um, so I just ask if you can do that or if you have control over the, the public um, that come to your meetings that you just relay that to them as well because it is, it is important that, um, that they end up in front of all the commissioners. And the one thing I do want to add, I know there's been a lot of um, talk about the lack of a New York City commissioner on the board. Um, the governor's office, I know, I, I'm not involved in the, in the vetting process. I'm not involved in the selection process. I'm really not involved at all in any of it other than the fact that I know, because I've asked, um, that they are actively and have been actively seeking candidates um, for the third commissioner spot, and they're only looking in New York City. Um, this will be a New York City commissioner. Generally, there's at least one and usually two on the board. I think because I've lived, I had lived in New York and I still own property in New York, um, that you know, I kind of bridge the gap for the other one, but there is absolutely no question that they are focusing on a New York City commissioner. And that, if it, do, it should happen before the end of the term, this term, and if it doesn't, um, I certainly will you know, make my objections very loud, because um, we need a third commissioner. There's no question about that. The board runs better with three commissioners, and certainly somebody from New York City would be um, you know, great for the community boards as well as the licensees who, you know, they come in and, and it, it's important that the person know the neighborhoods who can also relay and ask questions that maybe Commissioner Ford and I are not thinking of. So, um, but that I do expect to be dealt with very, very quickly and they have been working very hard at, at finding the right person. So, uh, at this point I will open it up to questions. Some questions were submitted, so I, I'll deal with those first. Um, the first question that was submitted was that the Stipulation agreements have helped the community boards a great deal. However, when the agreements are not being adhered to, what are the recommendations for enforcement? Can community boards notify the SLA when an establishment is not abiding, abiding by the agreement? Definitely uh, notify us. I take the stipulations extremely seriously. If they violate any of them um, I, and I find out about it, I immediately tell my director of enforcement to send somebody out there. Um, so if we get a complaint from you, and once again, I would, you don't have to go through Mike for that. You certainly can use the way we do the normal complaint system and do it anonymously or sign your name to it, but the quickest way to get a response is to go directly through Mike. That would um, be the CB complaints mailbox. Mm -hmm. so. But I would recommend and urge you to do that because what happens a lot, particularly in, when we have a um, licensee who's opening another establishment, um, so they're opening their second establishment, and frequently the community boards will come in and have great objection to them getting a liquor license at their second establishment because they will have significant history with them. Yet I will check our history and we have zero. Which to me means we didn't, when I say zero, it means not only did we not prove any charges, we didn't get any complaints. So it's very hard for me because that I know 
is hard evidence of what we have, and it's very hard for me when they come up and say we don't have any violations, yet the community board is telling me, well, they've been violating stipulations for years, but nobody told us about it. Um, so it makes, it, it certainly will clear up that argument if those complaints come directly to us as quickly as possible. And like I said, we will act on them. We don't need more than one. It only takes one. Our enforcement department is basically complaint driven meaning that we get referrals from the police department about 95% of the time. The other 5% of the time are the, are the complaints that our investigators are going out and investigating and either bringing charges or not bringing charges, depending on what they find. Um, but we don't go out and just do, we don't have the resources to go out and just do blanket investigations of establishments. So as was, and it also shields us from being, being accused of targeting certain establishments. If we have a written complaint, then obviously there's a problem there and we go and investigate it and no one can say that we're picking on them. Um, the cabaret law, this, I think we're all aware of what, um, the, about the repeal and this is actually um, something that's kind of emerging. Um, I actually don't know what the effect is going to be. I know that if you ask them if they're, if they're, if you put in your stipulations that there's no dancing, then I'll enforce that stipulation and I don't care whether there's a cabaret license or not. Um, in the rest of the state, I believe most of the counties in the rest of the state don't have cabaret licenses. So yet they still, the, the municipality may say, well, we don't want dancing there. Um, so as long as you keep putting that in your stipulations, it'll be enforced whether the, the cabaret law is there or not. The next question was the NYPD best practices. Can community boards request that the New York State Liquor Authority enforcement officers respond to community complaints directly? Of course. Um, that's, we, have, we don't have a lot of investigators. We have about 27 statewide, but the large majority of them are in New York City. Um, and that's what they do. They respond to community complaints directly. Um, we get the complaint. The complaint is then assigned to an investigator. The investigator goes out and investigates it, either in a, in a uh, disclosed capacity or uh, undisclosed, which would mean he just shows up at the bar, walks around, um, or whatever the case may be, if it's a, if it's a bodega doing underage sales. Um, but they do frequently end up doing march operations with the NYPD, which are very effective, because it brings the NYPD, the um, fire department, the health department, um, as, as well as us, all into the establishment at the same time, and, and we do basically a full-blown disclosed um, examination of it, and we end up getting a lot, of, uh, a lot of charges out of that. One-day festival weekend walk SLA application. I'm not, well, I'm not, can community boards put stipulations on these one-day permits? Can a community board provide comment for a one-day applicant? I'm not following what, what, okay, so what are we talking about? So that's my question, so I'll, I'll clarify it. So we have a weekend walk program in the district um, where there are one day licenses that are issued during the events. So it's a, it's a street event, it's mostly restaurants. Um, we have a handful of restaurants that have a stipulation agreement with us as part of their regular application. So we've had this conversation is do those same stipulations um, transfer over when it's a one day in front of their establishment for this one day event. So that if there is, um, for example, a noise restriction as far as having outside DJ, you know, past a certain yeah. time, could we yeah. also ask that on a one day? I mean, you're talking about a street festival that's in front of this yeah. restaurant, just yes. happens for this day to be in front yes. of this restaurant. Yeah, the stipulations still apply. Still apply. So okay. they can't throw a DJ out in the front of their building or, um, I assume they're not part partaking in anything with the festival. I mean, their, their customers aren't walking out with alcohol, correct? Well, it's an outside, for this one day, there is alcohol restricted in an area. It's a one day permit that is, that is issued. Oh, okay. Mike's telling yeah. me I wasn't part of that meeting. Yeah. Go ahead. We just had the okay. meeting with Dawn. Dawn and I oh, okay. Each other frequently. Yeah, we're Regarding, just trying to get a handle on. Uh, that, that's a unique scenario. Like I was talking about the fifth. And uh, this is where uh, we do it all, in other places like uh, San Gennaro, right. where it's, it's actually it's an alteration that we're granting to the license where they could use it on the outside. And so they can serve the alcohol on the outside, but the, as far as the noise goes, that yeah. doesn't change. But we get 
input from you. They're supposed to notify the community board. Right. You're supposed to tell us any issues that you have. Yeah, so um, we're doing this tonight, which is why, uh, very timely. Um, yeah. We had an issue last year with two establishments who, um, so I heard. who, yeah, who didn't mm -hmm. uh, abide by the In agreement. what way didn't they abide by it? There was a rule in place with no DJ music, and they had a DJ. Um, and then we had to ask them to. Oh, so no. now we wanted to, on this year's license, actually stipulate and say, we'll approve you because there was no issues, there was no fighting, there was no problems. But if the sponsors of the, of the, sponsors of the event have a rule that says no DJ music, then you should not have had a DJ. Um, and we always feel our strength is in, in this review because we actually have them come in for conversation and discussion, but we want to know, can we? We know we could do it when we have an, a normal application, but this one day type of alteration application, could we say, you know, you cannot, you have to abide by the rules of the um, producer of the event. Yes. Okay. And, and, and just for example, the mayor's office reached out to our enforcement unit last year and asked us to start um, on certain of those events, I think mostly in Manhattan, asked us to start basically patrolling them um, in an undisclosed capacity. And I think I have a board meeting tomorrow and I was reviewing the materials. I think there's actually a charge in there that somebody, it was a wine and beer permit that they had, but they were serving mixed drinks out in the street and we wrote them up for yes. that. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can certainly tell yeah, we them. We want to make that clear tonight during our meetings. I just wanted to clarify yeah. So that. if the okay. mayor continues to ask us to do that, we will do it. Okay, um, great. And you can mention, Don mentioned it, the, uh, they could just deny the permit outright. Right. SAPO, right. so they, they can't participate. That, okay. that, that's the bigger hammer, actually. Yes. I didn't realize they could do that. Oh, they can pick out, they, they can, can pick, pick and choose who can right. participate. They can, they can, deny, they can right. deny the application on those, those right. problem restaurants. Okay, thank you. That's nifty. So licenses, license locations not open to the public. Um, so you're talking, is this about WeWork, places like that? Yeah, that, that, that was uh, our question. and. It, um, I think within the district office, it's um, not an issue. We're hoping you can provide a better explanation to our board members than we've been giving. Um, establishments like WeWork, or we have some uh, newer apartment buildings that primarily lease to recent graduates who want sort of a dorm-like environment, now even though they're now- They licensed? Adults, and so they will have, there'll be a bar, um, and it's for tenants and tenant guests only. Um, and since it's a bar, it needs a license. Correct. Um, but it's not open to the But public. I don't know that it is licensed, because I don't know that I've seen any of those. I have seen um, models like the WeWork thing you're talking yep. about, but I have not seen a. Uh, the, one, the one that I'm thinking of, actually, they said they were coming to us two or three times, and then I think ultimately didn't file. And <laughs> what, what they can do um, is what's called a bottle club which uh, an apartment building could do and make it a private club that way um, and have a full bar and it would not be open to the public. That's, a, that's part of the statute. Um, what these businesses are doing as far as sharing the office space and then having a bar up there, the only one, I think we've done a couple. I don't believe, you know, we work, I know, is in the process of trying to do it um, because we've met with them telling them that you have to be open to the public. Now that could mean you're allowed to charge a daily fee to use the space, the office space for a day, um, and it can't be an exorbitant fee, but that's open to the public. If I can go and pay my $40 mm -hmm. to sit down and use your internet and use your conference room or whatever, the, or, and your copiers or whatever, that's open to the public. Um, otherwise, if it's not and it's a yearly membership and that's it, then that has to be a bottle club, which has its own restrictions on it. Um, so open to public does not mean, um, I know from a buddy that there's a bar at WeWork and I'm going to take the elevator up to seven and have a beer. You would have to, have, you would have to be renting desk space. In well, I, according to their business model, okay. yes. But, okay. but that, that, you know, many clubs in, in, in New York have covers that are $30, $25 um, to get in. So it's similar to that. It would be like a cover charge, but you're getting not just for the drink, you're getting a lot of other things that they're allegedly focused on besides the alcohol. But some of these um, business models are you pay by the year, that's not open to the public, in my view. Uh, that doesn't fit within the statute. Could, could you elaborate a little bit about bottle clubs? I'm, the only ones that I'm familiar with are in dry states in the south. How do they operate in New York? 
No, it's like uh, they're not, one, they have to be a not-for-profit. Um, Soho House is a bottle club, which is, I think, I think you all know what Soho House is in, in New York. It's a private club that probably costs, I don't know, you have, one, I think you have to be recommended for membership or be sponsored or something, and then it's probably, you know, several thousand dollars a year to be a member. Um, but they're, they have multiple bars at the location as well as rooms that are to rent to their members. The members can bring guests, but you and I couldn't walk in there. In fact, Commissioner Ford tried to walk in the other day and they wouldn't let him. <laughs> and the establishment uh, procures and provides the alcohol? Yes. And, uh, and you're charged for it. As a member, you're charged for it. It's not free. The, the ones that I'm familiar with in the South, you, you bring your own alcohol. You have a lot yeah, I think you can bring your own in some of them, but um, that's what under New York law, that they would allow you to bring your own wine in if you wanted to, but they have bars as well. Okay. And there's one on the calendar tomorrow for a uh, spot in Novo that's a, in um, North of Houston that's um, is a not-for-profit that's going to be set up as a bottle club. Thank you. New Year's Eve all-night permits. Hmm. I didn't know the answer to this question, but Mike informed uh, they, me that they are on they the are website. posted, and uh, I, I looked at them last year. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't find them. Again, that's our yeah. website. It's on the website. It's yeah. on a website. Yeah. I had to Maybe look I had a to little know bit. Where it is? Maybe. Well, that and that yeah. that I just yeah. actually when that question came up, I emailed the website designers and said, "Could you put that in the frequently asked questions category?" Oh, that's. Good. So hopefully there'll be an answer to that on our new website. What would it take to stop? A 24-hour New Year's Eve permit. Um, police, a letter from the police that it's going to be a burden on their. Not the case. What do you mean? I can tell you, this past New Year's, the police and the community board sent letters of objection for a 24-hour on New Year's Eve for an establishment, and they were granted. I, I, I'm sure that happened. I don't recall the the in, the I in, the I the specific location, but um, that that's the exception rather than the rule. If I get a objection from the police, now what what happens particularly in Brooklyn, which um, is different than the other boroughs to me, is usually when the community board and the police are adamantly against something, the elected officials will be too, and that doesn't occur in Brooklyn frequently. Um, so. That may have been something that the, you know, because the way I look at it, and I think Commissioner Ford looks at it the same way, and it's not just for New York City, it's also for the other counties of the state. If the elected officials are coming out in favor of something, usually they know their communities better than I do. That, you, you're shaking your head, and I, I realize that, but that's, that, that's the norm for the state. It may not be the norm for Brooklyn. Um, so that, lends a lot of weight if I end up with a senator and an assemblyman from that district that are sending letters of support in for something um, it's and, and telling me what great people they are so in other words the police and the community board weren't enough yeah. no hold, hold on it usually second. is it okay. usually is but I'm just telling you we get mixed messages and it really usually only happens out here the problem is this is a board it's the last, it's the block that divides two councilmen. It's the block, it's like never man's land. So you're talking, next time we should reach out to electives. Someone is, because usually if there's police objection, I'm getting input from electives. Uh, let me just step in for a minute. Uh, uh, I'm familiar with this because of the timing issue. They have to apply in early November. I think the last day is November 10th. And we send out the information, we notify the police department. That is the only notification. And they have 15 days to respond. And many times it's around Christmas when we get the objection. The permit has already been issued. It's a matter of timeliness. And we could review it again, but we didn't have that information when the permit was issued. Are oh, you know the one we're talking about? No, it's more than one. Yeah. I mean, I get calls all the time, you know, the Bronx, all, all throughout the city. The precinct will call, because basically, I think we send it to the, the you know, in police precincts. We send a fax notification. Someone it's picks lost. it up, and then it's yeah, lost. exactly, it's lost. it gets lost. So it gets uh, lost. And the other aspect is it's very hard to get the police to put something on paper. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, if yeah. I just have a phone call from from a local precinct, 
and then I'm getting calls from other people in support of this, it's very hard. In fact, frequently I'll get the call from the precinct and then I'll tell the person calling from whatever office that, that the, the police department is against this and they say, no, they're not. I said, well, he called me. They Day later, I get a call from the police department, or from the elected saying, well, I got a letter from the police department saying they have no objection. Is there a way to notify the community board when these places apply for this 24 hour? Because we know the problematic locations, and it seems like these emails to the precinct are getting lost. Or ignored, I don't know. Okay. So There's the statute, and, and I don't have the res because this is a two week window, and the statute allows it to be a two week window, it, it, it has to turn over very quickly. And it's very hard for us to require them to notify you because we don't have any legal authority to do that and, and then fit within the statute of when we have to review these by. You, you know, you could just mail the information anyway or a resolution if you... Yeah, whatever you it'll send be in will of, be reviewed. We, we would make it part of the file. Yep, Matter of fact, the community board could comment on anything, in any, you know, like liquor stores. There's no notification to the community okay. board. But we t if you mail us our, uh, resolutions and you have an opinion about it, we'll, we'll put it in the file and it'll be looked at. So just consider an all-night permit similar where if you know these places have applied in the past and they're probably going to apply again, you could send something to us. Okay. Just do it in the middle of November. All-night all permits came up uh, the last time you were here, Mike, and um, it, it seems to me that, you know, maybe a, a middle ground is instead of getting notification about all the applications in an individual community district, if you could just give us a heads up, um, you know, All Saints Day and say the notifications are going out to the local precincts on such and such a date, um, pursuant to the redevelopment of the website, you can see, you can check all of them citywide at, at this web address and then individual community boards can easily do their own homework from there. Well, they well we issued? actually post the when permits they're when they're issued. Yeah. When they're issued. Yeah, yeah it's not. Yeah. So I think apply. it's better if we then, as you know, maybe we can adopt, you know, by board sometime in mid-November if we know of locations that are problematic. Because I could think of, you know, one or two that we may want to comment on in the month I, I of November. I think we issue between, I think it was 70, between 50 and 80 statewide. Yeah, so, so there's not a lot. In fact, a, a I'm whole. surprised I'm actually hearing about it because the bigger problem I have, particularly in this borough, is the, and it happens every summer, is the parties with 3,000 people at them. Um, now, they're generally not in every part of Brooklyn, but there's areas of Brooklyn where they're using abandoned lots and having pop-up rave parties and they're calling them catered events because they want the full bar. Um, and that is extremely problematic for me because I, that's where I get a lot of mixed messages as well. Um, and I end up one questioning, um, and one ended up on the front of the New York Post, and thank God we had denied it beforehand, but the people are walking around the lot in hazmat suits, you know, the day after the party was supposed to happen because it was a brownfield. Um, and we just, that once again is a two week window. So we would like to see more input from the police and that's the, that's the situation where I, I, I find it very difficult to get anything in writing from the police for whatever reason because you know, a, a temporary beer and wine permit is, is you can get that and do that anywhere and it's not as big a deal but when they want full bars and there's statutory requirements that go with getting the catering permit that mean that you have to be serving food and more than just hot dogs, it's gotta be a meal. Mm -hmm. um, and we get applications that indicate that, that they have fire department approval, they have this approval, they have that approval on the lot. And then I'm not saying on every party that it ends up being not true, but a lot of times we find out after the fact that it's not true. Um, that's what I thought I'd, I'd hear more complaints about because in, in that neighborhood it really um, is an issue, a safety issue. Yes. Hi, I'm from Com Community Board 9, uh, Public Safety Chair. I want to go back, I have two questions actually. I want to go back to what Mike said about liquor stores. 
Uh, I'm not clear on how that process actually worked because um, the liquor, they will send an application into the board, but they don't come in front of the, um, the public safety committee. And when we send them an email asking them to come in, uh, they don't appear. And the problem is becoming is the fact that we have liquor stores just right across the street from each other that's opening up, one down the block. So, you know, and it's, we are becoming, it's, it's becoming very inundated with liquor stores in our community, and the community is complaining. So I just want to know what are the rules and the policies on that on liquor stores? Well, one, there, there's no statutory requirement that they come see the community board, like okay. in a 500 foot law case. Right. Um, and they do have to give public notice, and it has to be posted on the location for 30 days? Yeah, I think 30, 30 days. days. Um, not been happening. And we don't get a lot of community board input on, on those because this, the legal standard for me to grant that uh, is public convenience and advantage. Is it public convenience and advantage to put another one there? And what we look at in, under the law in those instances is does the community, is this store providing something to the community that the other stores aren't? And I can tell you in your borough, it's very hard to get a liquor store right now. So I know there are some ac across the street from each other, but I don't know the last time um, that I've done that. And, particularly in Brooklyn. And most of the time what you'll see is pe people are replacing closed ones. Um, but certainly if a liquor store is a problem, meaning that there's either loitering going on or you see underage sales or whatever the case may be, send a complaint in because we do do s significant enforcement against liquor stores. And if you are against a liquor store going in a certain place after you do find out about it, you're obviously welcome to submit anything and I'll take it under consideration. I mean, if the community does not want it, that certainly is a strike against them. Um, and we do get a lot of input from communities sometimes that they don't want another liquor store, particularly in New York City and then in Rochester, Syracuse communities that are you know, more urban communities. There was an issue uh, where there were a new piece of place uh, opening up, like just diagonally across the street from the uh, liquor store. And the owner of the liquor store actually made a complaint, I think, to the um, state liquor authority that because this particular owner, new owner with the pizza place, wanted to serve uh, liquor, wine, and beer. And the uh, owner of the liquor store uh, sent a complaint to the state liquor authority stating that, it didn't, that this guy, the owner, the new owner of the pizza place was opening up too close, I think he said 200 feet from him and that was not allowed. It was a really that's a not, issue. That's not really, um, liquor stores and restaurants, mm -hmm. they're completely separate. That's what I said. Yeah. That's what um, I thought. So he just misunderstood the law. It would be 500, if there's three within 500 feet, then the, the community board has, uh, basically gives an opinion on whether the, it's in the public interest to put another restaurant or bar there, if there's three within 500 feet. And that's the opinion that we take into consideration and if they have not met with you, I will require them to meet with you before we vote on it. But you're talking about three within 500 yeah. feet of on-premise applications, on -premise, which yeah. wouldn't include the liquor well, store. Correct. The, the, liquor, yeah. the liquor store and bodegas are not included in that. Yes. The second question I had was about the temporary licenses for events that is going to only for one day. There was an issue with that this, our local precinct called the board and was quite upset at the fact that they didn't know that this was happening and that this um, temporary place had a, a temporary license. And so when we spoke to the state liquor authority, they said that we didn't, the community board nor the precinct do not have to be notified if it's only a temporary license. Correct. And that's not our rule. That's in statute. That's um, in statute. Yeah. And that you know, I don't. I have my own opinions about whether that should change. I do too, not, because it, it, they was creating a lot of problems, and that's why the the local precinct was called, and they was checking out the noise complaint that happened that particular night, and they didn't think that these folks had a temporary license. And but the police department does have to be notified, correct? Yeah, that's yeah. it. The police department is notified. And, and if they're not, well, they, that's well, they something they need that, to take well, up. Well, I mean, they always say they're not notified. That's <laughs> that's the problem. We don't notify them; they notify them. 
the, the applicant's supposed to notify them. I, I think we notify them too. Oh, we do. Okay. Yeah, but we send it to a fax machine in the precinct. Oh, that's the problem. So, that's the, well, that's that's actually a problem. An email. That's actually a problem because when we fax stuff over, they don't always get it. So you know, then when these kinds of uh, things come up, they call the board and said, "Why you didn't notify us that these folks had a license or they had a temporary license?" And now we have these complaints. The, the community boards are not notified for the one-day permit. You're not notified. Okay. Precincts are. But again, if you're aware of an event, you send us information, we'll take it into account. And may I ask this one more question? <laughs> um, the stipulations. Um, when, the, uh, when the applicant and when the establishment of business don't abide by the stipulations, uh, or they send an application into the board, and, they, and this is about a license for liquor, wine, and beer in a restaurant or a bar that's opening up. They send an application. Uh, we send them back the questionnaire that the stipulation is contained in it, and they don't show up in front of the committee, but they get approved by the state liquor authority, and they have not come to the board. They bypass the, They send the application. We send them the, the notice inviting them to come to the meeting, and you know just let us know about your, their business and they bypass that and they don't come, but the state liquor authority approves them. Uh, if it's a 500 foot law case, meaning that there are three other on-premise licenses within 500 feet, which means you, as a matter of law, the community board has to weigh in on what their opinion is of the, the licensee and this establishment. If they have not come to see you, they're not going to get voted on. Exactly, by us. exactly. But, no, we won't vote. I'll well, send them. Vote? I'll well, send them back to you. Oh, okay. But if it's not a 500 foot case, they're not required by law to come to you. Um, so at that point, you're welcome to put in the fact that they didn't, and I'll certainly use it against them because my view is they should still be coming to meet with you. Yeah. But but if they choose not to, and they can give me a valid reason why they didn't, maybe your stipulations were just completely out of bounds for them. Whatever yeah. the case may be. Um, we will vote on that because there's no requirement by law. I'll get sued by them if I, if I deny it based on that, and they'll win. But the 500 foot law cases is a different story. They have to come and, and get a, a, some type of either recommendation or uh, denial by the community board. And then you're always, always on every application welcome to come in and give your opinion. Right, but we've, all, we've always sent uh our opinion to the state liquor authority saying that this particular um, business did not come in from the board. Correct, and, and sometimes they don't. We, sometimes they don't have to. That's that what I'm trying to tell you. Approved, but it's approved anyway. Right. Sometimes so, they're not. Sometimes by law they're not required to come see you. And if they're not required by law to come see you, I'm not going to make them. Gen general, internally, if there's community board objection, whether it's 500 foot or not, we would write it up to send to the full board for review. But they have a different legal analysis. In cases like that, you should send a resolution stating these are the issues with this place and the area, whatever. I mean, we don't like to see a general denial. Say they, they didn't show up and we don't want them to have a license. But if you could send a resolution saying we'd like to meet with these people to discuss the issues and you have some uh, reasons why you deny it, then uh, we more than likely send it to the full board whether it's a 500 foot or not. But we need some reasons. Right, yeah. because it's, it's a concern because there's a part of our district that is becoming inundated with um, bars and restaurants opening up and they're just down the block from each other, uh, just around the corner, you know. And, when we and, receive and an like, application. It's in, a three, and it's in a three to four block radius that you have these establishments that serve alcohol and they are, and uh, one is here I, and one is there. I think what Mike's trying to say is that, and, and this happens regularly throughout New York City, not just in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. we will get denials from community boards that say, we're not supporting this application. That helps me zero mm -hmm. because I don't have any reason. You didn't give me a reason that either the guy has a bad history with you, that there are 17 bars within 500 feet that that he wants to have a DJ, he wants this, he wants that, that he's lying to me, that he's not gonna be a restaurant, and you know it because. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, as he said, we just get a blanket denial, and that's useless to me. 
even on a 500 foot or non 500 foot case. If you're going to send something in writing, be specific about why you don't want that there. And if it's the owner or the fact that there's too many or the fact that there's 12 apartments above it, whatever the case may be, at least then I can ask questions. But when there's a straight denial and I look at them and I say, why did they deny you? And they look back at me and say, we have no idea. We never even talked to them. That's hard. That's a hard hearing for me to deal with. Um, but you know, like Mike said, if you, if you oppose it, it's going to end up in front of me, okay. no matter why you oppose it. I just need specific reasons. We send out letters to each community board when an application is filed, mm -hmm. whether it's a 500 foot, because we, we have uh, time limitations. And I believe it will say, you know, we receive this application, we give about 20 days, I believe. Yeah. 30. We have 30. 30. Mm -hmm. uh, more generous than I thought. But we so need, thank you. We need uh, uh, something from you in writing, okay. you know. And I've seen where some applicants intentionally avoid meeting with you. Yes. So that is very helpful to say, you know, they gave us notification three months ago. We asked them to come in the Jared and, and they didn't come. And we asked them to come February, they still didn't come. They promised that they wouldn't file until they meet with us, but they filed anyway. So we'd be more inclined to hold off on that application if it's their fault. But then again, we have the issues when it's over the summer and say, well, we're not meeting. It's June. We're not meeting till September. Can you, we can't hold off for four months. Yeah, because statutorily, we have to move on a license within a certain number of days. Um, mm -hmm. So we can't, I, I realize that you're all, or most of the people on the community boards are volunteers and that, you know, during the summer months, it's hard to get them together. But unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. Um, and if the licenses don't move, someone's going to come from my head. So um, I do want to get through this list, though. The, Thank the you. BYOB, and then I will continue to take questions, but the BYOB, if, the, if, an, if a location or establishment is not licensed by us, we have no jurisdiction. You have to call the police. So if they're serving alcohol at a restaurant that does not have a license or letting people bring it in and they're not licensed, that's a police matter. Um, and that will guarantee they probably don't ever get a license if they do get arrested for that. Um, rear yards. <laughs> Does the SLA review compliance with local ordinances pertaining to the certificate of occupancy for outdoor rear use? So this came up at the last board meeting. Whenever we grant a license and the rear yard is part of the license premises, and or the building is part of obviously part of the license premises, the license is conditioned on the fact that they either get a, a, a letter of no objection from the Department of Buildings or a C of O that indicates that it's. Um, that this business is this is the proper place for it to be and that they can uh, do what they say they're going to do on it. I realize that de the Department of Buildings in New York City is extremely slow. Um, and sometimes I, I also realize that sometimes that they don't, or I'm hearing, that they don't issue violations as regularly as you would all like. I am not in the business of being their enforcement arm. Uh, like I said, we do the entire state and for me to start dealing with New York City zoning issues means I would have to deal with every zoning issue in every town in the state. And we don't have the people, and I certainly don't have the knowledge or the, the, the wherewithal to try to figure out the zoning laws all over New York State. So we rely on them to do what they're supposed to do. And if they don't do it, um, there's not much I can do about that. If they do do it and they do issue violations after we've licensed a place, well, that's a charge against them, against the establishment, and we will go in and do an enforcement action. And if it's zoned and put in there illegally, then they'll be shut down, at least as far as the liquor goes. We can't do anything about shutting down a restaurant. And I try to make it akin to if the place never had alcohol and, it, and a restaurant's not supposed to be there, then the restaurant's not supposed to be there. It has nothing to do with whether they have alcohol or not, and DOB should be the ones that are the ones making sure they're not there. So, um, but we do, the license is conditioned on the C of O, and if that includes the backyard, if the license includes the backyard, then they're gonna need um, the backyard to have uh, something from DOB saying they can serve on it, which would be, I guess, a letter of no objection. Can adverse history data be made available by a community district? That's, right now, from what I understand, you can look that up, Mike is telling me, correct? Uh, in our GIS system, you could look up the, uh the, loca the location, and uh, it'll tell you the, the uh, disciplinary history, the proven disciplinary history of uh, each restaurant. So what we can't give you is open investigations. Um, 
uh, for obvious reasons. But if there is charges against the location, you're supposed to be able to get that on our website. But what I did do is email the website designer, and one, put that in a frequently asked question, and two, to see if there was another way to go about it and make it easier. Obviously, I don't have an answer to that question because I just asked it. But um, that is something that I think um, we are going to try to make more easily available, as well as the stipulations for the establishment, because I know, I know you can get those now, but I don't think it's that easy to get them on the website. So, um, but if you want any particular um, location, you're welcome to email Mike or, or do a FOIL request. Um, our FOIL, we did have a problem with it a few months ago, but it seems to be working much better now. And if you're just asking about one or two locations in their adverse history, you'd get that pretty quickly. I think with FOIL, you could get uh, pending charges, though. I believe notices of pleading that are out. As well as the history. Right. Yeah. So you could get more with the FOIL. More with the FOIL. Uh, we only put on the website the proven history. Question. Yes. Um, establishment gets a liquor license. Next year they apply for a sidewalk cafe. Do they have to amend that liquor license? Yes. To be able to serve on the sidewalk? Yes. And that comes up a lot in stipulations. And what I don't do in stip when you submit stipulations, what I don't I approve 95% of your stipulations. The one I don't approve, I might change the hours a little bit, not significantly. If, they're, if you guys are asking for 12, I might give them one or 130. I'm not giving them four. Um, but frequently I see a stipulation that says the licensee promises never to apply for a sidewalk cafe. Well, I, 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 you can't enforce that. Um, but what you can do is say, should he apply for a sidewalk cafe, that alteration has to come back here first. That I will enforce. And then you'll get to review it and put your two cents into us before we approve it. But yeah, they have to get. But um, I'm saying the law, your, your rules yes, they have require to come them back. to come back. Yes, but I, your stipulation can require that they notify you before they come to me. But when they come back to you, Aren't we automatically notified? Because they're, they're if it's an alteration, I, I think alteration you are in that right alteration. You probably are, right, but there's no that. requirement that they come back to you. Oh, there's no requirement they come back. But to if us. you put it in your stipulation, I will enforce that. Yeah, and just I need a little more clarity. Earlier you said they're not required to come before the cream bill. You're just talking about beer and wine. Say that again. Earlier you said that. Uh, certain applications are not required to come before the community board. Are you talking about just beer and wine license? If no, I'm for, talking about the, if they're even not a full a, liquor license. Yeah, on a 500 foot case, they, they, they have to notify you, but they're not right. required to meet with you. So, oh, so full liquor license application is not 500 foot. They don't necessarily have to come before the Correct. community board. But they always should. I mean, it's going to, like Mike said, we, we, we don't, we frown upon the fact if they refuse. Okay. I mean, the statute says notify. It doesn't right. say show up. But then if they don't show up, what's the purpose of notifying? I mean, right. so, I have sent them back when they have it, particularly so, if you have certain specific No, they always, come, they always come to our board, but... Well, Brooklyn and Manhattan, they usually do because it's, it's a very competitive well, environment. But for those who don't, how do we then go about issuing any objections if we haven't spoken to them to figure out do we even have objections to them if they don't come? Because you well, said that's we, we just can't no, say That's don't. what you said then you say that. If they haven't come and you don't have any idea what their business model is, then you say, we have no clue what their business model is. It's clear they want to be open at 4 o'clock, blah, blah. You know, we have 20 bars within whatever distance. And that's already an ambient noise problem. Above the location are apartments. You know, there are things you can see or could be problems that you don't have answers to. I mean, that's what happens when, when they don't show up and they try to get a license from me. I have all these questions. If nobody's there to answer the questions, they're not getting it because I, I have the same questions you would have. Okay. Notify, but don't have to show up. Got it. Thank you. I wasn't shaking my head at you earlier. It was no, a thought I, I was having about elected officials yeah. in general. <laughs> um, I'm not elected. <laughs> we, um, right. Yeah, um, so you, so you believe that. <laughs> um, First of all, we, we have very few problem locations, and Mike, we're so grateful that when we, we do have a question, you're so quick to respond and always so helpful, so thank you. Um, well, thank you. We, the, the one really bad problem location we have, though, is, is a tough one, and it is, we took a homicide there 6 a.m. January 1st. That's how they started off the year. Um, that license is inactive now, but there's still parties going on, so they are allowed to operate as a venue that just can't serve alcohol, correct? Correct. And, but but we, we get social media 
um, that advertises parties that, that suggest it be. So can we provide the social media information that we get about this in another location that I'm concerned about? That you think they are selling out or, or so, yeah. You yeah. can file a complaint, send the social media in, and what we'll do is get the police department and go out there with them. Okay. Um, because they are technically still licensed, so it would be a charge if they're serving without the license because they are licensed. You said it's inactive, yeah. so it's been, did we shut, did we do a summary suspension, is that why? I don't know if it's, it, it says inactive. Does that mean it's, it's Temptations, Legends, Brooklyn Rocks? It was, it was suspended. Well, I'm, I'm well aware. Yes, you are. Yes. So then, yeah, send it in and we'll send people out there. It's being I'm aware litigated. Of it too. It's being litigated right now. Oh, okay. So they got a okay. state. And I know the precinct Did is on it. Like, no, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be selling alcohol right now. Okay. So we'll go in there on a night that you, you know, on, on the social media that indicates. Matter of fact, send me that information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'll Thank be you. the end of that case. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for being here. My name is Jamie Tigrisoso. I'm the Latino Outreach for the Office of Brooklyn Borough President. Um, around last year, um, I received um, a couple of complaints from the uh, restaurant association and a couple of Latino business where um, was made aware to me that there's been a couple of trains for licensees, so usually done upstate about ABC law. It is a suggestion um, that they come to the New York City of perhaps coming to Borough Hall and we can... Yeah, someone someone um, did bring that up to me who to our agency who appears in front of us on numerous occasions and we indicated to her we'd be happy to do that but it needs to be mobilized and we said if you go and find you know tell us where you want to have it and we'll bring it we'll, we'll schedule it and bring the guy down here um, but we never heard back from her about it well you're yeah you're welcome to call us then but this was a, a an attorney who appears in front of us who I think is part of uh, the Hispanic Restaurant Association um, and we just never, it's been brought up on two separate occasions by her and the response is sure we'd be happy to do it but we never get any follow up. Um, but we'd be happy to do it if you call my uh, public information officer we'll set something up. Right, thank you. Yes. Hi, Caroline Church, Community Board 2. Um, my question is about alterations to licenses such as name changes, corporate changes, I'm not sure that the board gets notified and I'm wondering if we should because sometimes I hear of the name of a business and then I'm like, hmm, that's not familiar. And well, they, they can change their DBA on the renewal without notifying. I mean, they have to notify our agency, but they don't have to notify me. Um, so they're allowed to do that at years or they can do it in between with an application to do it. Um, so the board does not get notified about that. Corporate changes, we would not be told about as a board, but the agency has to be told about it. They have to file an application to do a corporate change, and we do a, whatever background check we do for the initial application we would do for the new um, owners of the corporation. Uh, unless there is an issue that pops up, we would not hear about that either. And when I say an issue, meaning that they're trying to add somebody to the corporation that has a significant negative history with us as far as charges or things of that nature. But if it's just someone who has no history um, with the SLA, then, and when, when I say we do a background check, you know, we do fingerprints, we make sure they're not convicted felons, things of that nature. And it's anyone that owns more than 10% of the corporation. Corporate change is if it's over 80%, the community board is notified. Because uh, they wouldn't file a new application, but they do 100% sale of the assets, which basically is bringing a new owner. So if a corporate change involves more than 80% of the assets, they notify the community board. Uh, DBA changes, there's no notification. It's done with endorsements. And it happens all the time with no notification to the community board. However, uh, when I find a place closes for a couple weeks or a couple months and opens up with a new name, that implies a possibility of a new owner. So. It's a symptom, I mean, when they open up with a new name, there might be other people, and that's where it's helpful for the community board to say, wait a second, there's a new guy out front, you know, he's yeah. a new manager, and he's claiming. So that's a different But problem. we would have to be told about the new manager, one. Um, and two, the DBA doesn't mean that their method of operation changes. Mm -hmm. So if they're changing their method of operation, they have to file a, a, a change of method of operation with us. And depending on what that is, it would, I would make them go to you. So if they're asked, they're, they're, they're going to go and start doing live music. Well, I'm not signing off on that until you guys do. Okay, that's good to know because...
some months ago, I ran across a business and I said, oh, I didn't know. I handled the SLA applications at the office. I'm like, I didn't know about this. I called up the um, attorneys and they're like, huh, really? Okay. And two weeks later, the name was changed back and then a couple months mm -hmm. later, they went out of business. <laughs> Can I ask another question? Yes. Um, the, uh, how is SLA going to interact, if, if at all, with the new nightlife mayor? No idea. I have not met her. Um, I don't know her. Uh, I imagine I will meet with her at some point. Um, I'm more interested in how you're all going to interact with her. Yeah. <laughs> so let's stay in touch. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't, what, what she's, I, I don't know what her role is going to be in the application process. I think her role is going to be more geared towards your processes than ours. Um, but I'm sure I will end up having interactions with her. Um, you know, it, it, it seems that she's there to, to lobby for the industry. And, you know, the only people I want to see when we're reviewing licenses are the applica applicant and any community members that are against it or community members that are for it. Um, so I don't know what kind of input she would have in that regard. Um, she certainly probably would have input in certain policies that we have, but I have no idea what those would be at this point. Okay, thanks. You are regulated by state, correct? Pardon me? You are regulated by state. We are the state, yeah. So we're a state agency, but um, a large portion, and when I say large, probably over 75% of the licenses that we regulate are here. Right, so it's not like they can issue any policy changes without... No, no, she can just come in and lobby to change yeah. certain policies to make them friendlier for the industry, um, which in order for us to change any regulation that we do or rule, it has to, it has to be uh, pub published. And you'll all have notice of that and you'll see it and, and you certainly have input as well. I mean, I don't anticipate that happening. I'm just speculating. I have no idea. Okay. I just want to say... Um, from Community Board 10, we have over 200 licensed premises within our community district, and we've only had um, problems with just a small handful. And each Good. time we've had an issue, Mike has been very responsive um, to our board, and we do appreciate you coming today and, and opening this dialogue and the continued relationship we have with your agency. So thank you. No, thank you for having me. I mean, I, 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 I and Brooklyn's always been very cooperative. For, but uh, as has Manhattan, because I think obviously the biggest issues for licensees are in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, but we're having trouble reaching out to the other community boards. Now, I'd like to do this more often. And I realize it's very difficult to get you all together um, and then fit me in as well. But um, I'm available. If you see something significant happen and need, feel the need to talk to me, I'm available anytime. I mean, the one thing that I basically coming into this job knowing nothing about it was that I'm going to make sure I'm as accessible as possible. Um, and I hope I have been. If you feel like I'm not, then please feel free to call me and ask me to come down because I'll come down. We have an office here. I'm down here every week. So this is not, um, you know, this is not a burden on me to come meet with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for setting it up, Joseph. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm, I'm It, the, the temporary beer and wine permits, it's generally, it's generally three or four unless they're, it's not written in stone, but it's generally three or four unless there's extenuating circumstances. Okay. We had issues with a location that was in, again, not a vacant property, but it was a large tract of land that was open, and they had 25 permits to operate music, uh, as a music venue, and they were using someone else to sponsor the license. Right. So we have concerns about that. And so that would be that. That would be a, a, an exception that, uh, had I known about it, would have stopped. I don't think that that'll. You, I don't think you'll see that this year. If that happened last year. Because that location, we were asked to make comments because they wanted to change the stipulations that you guys. Um, Is it a full license, or they're getting? I don't. I don't know whether you're. I don't. Full license. Oh, they're a full license. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's not a temporary wine and beer permit. They were operating with temporary. Okay, so what we did was they tell them to get a license. Four year, but they were given 25. Okay, but they're now licensed. They're now licensed. Okay. Now they want to change the stipulations. We're asked to make comments on that. Right. And we have concerns about the enforcement of Then express them. Hour. Like they want to extend their hours that people can stay on the property. Well, then express them. Sorry. Express them to us because that will come in front of us. But those are the questions that have been answered first. Is well, I can't answer questions about a pending application. That's that's a board no, no, question. In general, how they operate, you know, what are I know I know the place you're talking about, and that that, like I said, was a, a, a an exception because we were being in, if the, the indication we were getting from the representation was that they were in the process of applying for a license, mm -hmm. which they did eventually do. Um, and that ended up being a very controversial and combative license application with us. Um, so if you don't want the stipulations to change, then make that clear to us. Well, the big, big concern here is that they're located in an area where they're trying to make that like a new type I can't really get into it now because it no, sounds like they're going to apply. There are other locations that have applied to do the same type of, of Then every, for, see that, and you have to do every license is dealt with by application, meaning we don't deal with them in a in a you know vacuum that all of them are together. We deal with each one as it, as it comes I in front of us. Back and say, if someone wants to do an event and they're getting like a temporary permit to do this event, there's only can be four on one location. If it if it's an unlicensed location, right. that generally is the rule. It's on occasion we have been allowed people like if the application is pending and there's no community outcry about it, we do let them do more, but it, we don't let them circumvent the application process, which is what, if someone's doing 20 and they don't have an application in, they're not gonna get a license. They're just gonna keep doing events. And some other questions I'll, I'll forward them to you. You can ask them now, as long as they're not about pending applications or enforcement. I'm sure other people may have the same um, question. I, I don't have any problem with you asking them to do that. I just don't know that I can enforce it. Okay. And I can tell them they should do it. And, and if in terms of the hours of operation that alcohol can be served, how can, is this monitored or enforced in any way? If we get a complaint that they're serving so after the, if trip. we get a complaint that they're serving after they're supposed to be serving, we send an investigator in undisclosed at that time and if they're serving alcohol they'll be charged and you always can do the same with the police but the police obviously are disclosed okay anything else well thank you for your time i appreciate it like thank i said anytime you want to speak with me feel free to get in touch with mike to set something up so that concludes our uh, formal agenda. I just want to make one announcement and I'll open it up. Um, any other questions or comments or whatever. Tomorrow afternoon, some of you may have seen this, we're hosting a rally in Prospect Park from two to five. Uh, that's a student-led rally to address the issue of gun violence. Uh, it'll be at the Banshell in Prospect Park. It's open to the public. Uh, you can go onto our website and get all the information, but we're, we anticipate it to be a very large event in conjunction and coordination with um, what's happening with the student walkout in many schools at 10 o'clock tomorrow, as well as the March for Our Lives happening in D.C. Mm -hmm. and New York City on the 24th. So please take that information back. You're Andrew, I'm sorry, where in the parks? Are, the Banshell? Yeah. At the Banshell from 2 to 5. I should have It'll be uh, almost entirely led by students, um, student MC, student uh, speakers, student uh, presentations. We're also going to have action tables to uh, encourage students to write to the elected officials, learn who the elected officials are, uh, make signs for the gun marches happening the following weekend, register to vote, get information on their community boards, um, so hopefully you get more applications next year, uh, and things like that. So it, it, again, it'd be primarily youth-driven, but we are trying to make it as large an event as possible. Tomorrow, two to five. Uh, and with that, I'll any other questions? 
Any issues to discuss? Yes. Announcement. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to announce that we're having our 11th annual youth conference this coming Thursday at the Flatbush Y. I've got a few flyers here. But this is the event where we have about 80 agencies, organizations, and, um, and businesses. And we get about five to 600 uh, young people walking through the door just within three hours' time. It's really cool. It's very, it gives me so much hope for the future. So combined with Great. tomorrow and then the next day at the youth conference, we just will all have a lot of hope. Fantastic. Anyone else? Any other old business? No? All right. Then with that, I say thank you very much. Next meeting is in April. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thanks. If you didn't sign in, please make sure you sign the attendance sheet that was passed around. Thank you.